The US and Houthis are exchanging blows in Yemen and the Red Sea. Could this drag the US into a wider war in the Middle East? Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. Do you smell that? It's the smell of fear. Boy, the mainstream media is using that to its advantage. Last week, the US, with support from Britain and other countries, struck Iranian-backed Houthi militants in Yemen. The first two waves struck on Thursday, according to the US Air Force. Over 100 precision-guided munitions were used to hit over 60 targets at 16 locations, including command and control nodes, munition depots, launching systems, production facilities, and air defense radar systems. The US then launched another airstrike against a radar site on Friday. Many are now bracing for chaos in the Middle East. But are we really fumbling into chaos like lemmings falling off a cliff? Well, first it helps to know how we got where we are today. The target of the US's controversial actions in Yemen are the Houthis. They're suspected of receiving Iranian weapons and training. Both the Houthis and Iran see Saudi Arabia as a common enemy. The Houthis are named after their founder and are part of the Zadi branch of the Shiite Islamic faith. They've been in conflict with the Sunni Islamic Yemeni government backed by Saudi Arabia since 2014. Even after facing years of Saudi-led military campaigns, the Houthis still managed to maintain control in the western part of Yemen, an extremely strategic location along the Red Sea that can threaten global trade. According to the White House, nearly 15% of global seaborne trade passes through the Red Sea, including 8% of global grain trade, 12% of seaborne traded oil, and 8% of the world's liquefied natural gas trade. After many years of fighting, the Yemeni civil war entered a cooling period in 2022, when the United Nations brokered a ceasefire between the warring parties. And all was good, until October 7th. After Israel retaliated against Hamas for its initial attack, the Houthis started shooting missiles in Israel's direction, as well as at cargo ships passing through the Red Sea. The situation came to a head when the Houthis hijacked the Galaxy Leadership, a vehicle carrier ship owned by an Israeli businessman and operated by a Japanese firm. The ship and its crew remain in Houthi control. Since mid-November, the Houthis have threatened more than two dozen cargo ships with missiles and drones, and many of them have little, if any, connection to Israel. It's like they modified six degrees of Kevin Bacon to six degrees of Israel to see who they're going to attack next. This has forced more than 2,000 ships to change to a much longer shipping route between Europe and Asia by going all the way around the African continent instead of through the Suez Canal in Egypt which raises both costs and delivery times, and in turn makes consumer goods more expensive. To give you a picture of just how bad things have gotten, according to the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, the cost to ship a standard 40-foot container from China to Northern Europe has jumped from $1,500 to $4,000. In response, a coalition of more than 20 countries, including the US, formed Operation Prosperity Guardian in mid-December to guarantee freedom of navigation. But the US refrained from direct confrontation with the Houthis. The last thing it wants is for conflict to escalate, especially when there are other security matters to focus on. That's why the US restrained itself to simply shooting down missiles from Yemen, kind of like how Israel focused on just shooting down Hamas missiles before October 7th. The US refrained from direct confrontation until the 31st of December, when US Navy helicopters fired on a group of small boats attempting to board a container ship that had requested their protection. Shortly after, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned of consequences for the Houthis if they continued their strikes. And continue they did. So staying true to Blinken's warning, the US struck back. So what did the Houthis have to gain from all this? I'll tell you after the break. Welcome back. So what exactly do the Houthis gain from attacking cargo ships from around the world? Well, for one, the attacks show solidarity with the Palestinians, which in turn give the Houthis credit among people in Yemen and the wider Muslim world. Additionally, it helped Houthi numbers. According to a senior researcher at the Sana Center for Strategic Studies, the Houthi attacks on Red Sea commerce have been seen as largely positive and helped increase the Houthis' recruitment efforts in Yemen. And if there's anything that I've learned from the Hamas attacks, it's that being anti-Israel really does help rally some people together. Wow, 
haven't seen that much anger since last week in New York City. Along the lines, some also think that the Houthis want a reputation boost from being able to claim that they fought against the U.S., knowing full well that the U.S. has absolutely no desire to fight in Yemen with boots on the ground. There's also the possibility that the Houthis believe that they can bully the world in compromises with the threat of violence. Whatever the case may be, the U.S. had enough tolerating Houthi attacks and struck back. Was this the right move? Many defended the strikes, arguing that the U.S. strikes were proportionate and long overdue. They argue the U.S. shouldn't worry about making the conflict worse because the conflict was already getting worse. It was just a matter of whether the U.S. and its allies would respond sooner or later. As an example, according to a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, the strikes did not take things to the next level since they were isolated to the exact systems that were holding the Red Sea at risk. But even if the Houthis aren't deterred, U.S. strikes could at least weaken their capabilities. Better than nothing, since not imposing a cost for attacking would simply allow them to go on without end. As for the legality of it, defenders point to the way the U.S. fought off pirates and say no American law constrains the president from defending U.S. interests and its allies against immediate aggression, and the retaliatory strikes in Yemen didn't require Congress's approval. Others have very different ideas. Oman's foreign minister warned that the strikes in Yemen only add fuel to an extremely dangerous situation, which is why he urges that all parties exercise restraint. Even Saudi Arabia, yes, Saudi Arabia, the same country that sought to crush the Houthis, called for restraint. Kind of like how they restrained women from driving cars for so many years. The reason is they're trying to prevent conflict from upending a ceasefire in Yemen with the Houthis. Who would have thought that Saudi Arabia, which was once hell-bent on bombing the Houthis into smithereens, now calls for doing the exact opposite? Because the Houthis are right at their doorstep. It's understandable why Saudi Arabia would be concerned. But Saudi Arabia and Oman aren't the only ones critical of U.S. intervention. Even within the U.S., there's criticism from progressive Democrats, who never, ever complain about anything. Ever. Progressive Democrats fumed over the Houthi strikes, arguing that Biden didn't have the authority to call for strikes in Yemen. California Congressman Ro Khanna posted on X that the president needs to come to Congress before launching a strike against the Houthis in Yemen, according to Article I of the U.S. Constitution. Squad members Rashid Tlaib, Cory Bush, and Ilhan Omar echoed similar concerns. Even some Republicans, like Senator Mike Lee, agreed. Wow, never thought I'd say Mike Lee and Rashida Tlaib agree on something. Time to buy a lotto ticket. Now, constitutional issues aside, many make the case against bombing the Houthis on practical grounds, arguing that retaliatory strikes wouldn't deter Houthis, who are already used to dealing with missile strikes, and instead only empower them. Which is why some say that the U.S. strike might play into the hands of the Houthis in the long run. Basically, the Western aerial attacks do little to address the roots of the problem or prevent its recurrence in instances of regional turmoil, such as the Gaza War. Some see the protests in Yemen as proof of their case. <laughs> Regardless of where you stand on this debate, one thing for certain is that the U.S. needs a long-term strategy to figure out how to do more than just kick the can down the road when dealing with the Houthis. It'll probably take more than just some airstrikes to cripple the Houthis. After all, they've had years of experience dealing with airstrikes from a Saudi-led coalition. The Houthis are already vowing a strong response, but it remains to be seen how this will play out in the rest of the Middle East. It should go without saying, but... After seeing people cheer for Hamas and now the Houthis, now would be a good time to remind people that the Houthis aren't exactly nice people. The Houthis have a history of recruiting child soldiers, torturing journalists, and they've recently published videos of fighters practicing attacks on civilians. Not exactly something I'd be cheering for, especially if you really care about your many lives. With a world as dark and pessimistic as ours, you'll probably find that now's a good time to be exploring God for help. But which god? Find out in the latest episode of my new show, Deep Thoughts While Gaming. And as always, America Uncovered wouldn't exist without your support. All it takes is a dollar an episode, and you can set a monthly limit. Click on that orange button to head over to Patreon. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.